Welcome everybody. I'm going to continue to welcome people because I see that more and more people are joining. So I'm going to wait a few minutes until I see that most people have joined. Um, uh, in the meantime, I'm going to introduce Zach Corser. Zach, I, I forgot to sort of write down all the things I should say about you. I do think that many of our uh, members know you pretty well because you've spoken to us several times before and um, you've run for office in Claremont. And so, um, uh, so I think our members know you. So uh, we have 22 participants now. So I think we should go ahead. And Zach, you can introduce yourself um, and go ahead and start. Okay, um, thanks very much, uh, Barbara, for, for the invitation. And thanks very much to the League of Women Bo Voters of the Mount Baldy area for the invitation. I'm uh, very pleased to, to be talking about this subject today with you all. I'm gonna share my screen here because uh, I've got a presentation for you. Um, I suppose we're all used to Zoom these days. Uh, so bear with me as we work our way through some slides to help organize our discussion. The title of today's discussion is Defending Democracy. And this is obviously a very broad category. And you can tell by the picture that I've used here that, you know, defending democracy is, is a, an idea that we could think about as, as being one of preserving our institutions, thinking about uh, everything from um, the way in which we conduct our elections to the ways in which uh, our legislature operates. I and mean, it's a really broad category, but Unfortunately, just in the last couple of months, uh, defending democracy has become a rather literal concept. You know, now we've got concertina wire and fences surrounding the US Capitol because it seems like something fundamental is breaking down in our political order. And I, you know, I don't want to talk too broadly today. I was sort of thinking around about you know, what is a topic or an idea that's part of this concept of defending democracy um, that, that is A, essential to the idea of democracy and B, one that, that we can sort of discuss within an hour, I think with some depth, I hope, um, and that gives you some ideas about um, sort of you know, the state of play right now in terms of you know, 2021, 2022, and 2024 as we look forward to the next elections. You know, what we saw in November and December and January of this last year were very alarming. Um, while we did have a uh, successful election, and I, I'd like to highlight some things that really went right in 2020, there's a lot of work yet to be done to help ensure that future elections uh, will be just as successful. So I'll move on to uh, my first slide. Um, here's what we're going to talk about today. And I imagine that we'll talk, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes about uh, the subject, and then I'll give you some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, but here's what I'd like to discuss today specifically. I'd like to talk about the effects of the pandemic on the 2020 election, because of course, it, you know, in addition to, to more political ideas about 2020, we were facing and continue to face, um, a, a, you know, a once in a hundred year pandemic that required a lot of innovation in a very short amount of time. And want to talk about, you know, what was done in 2020 to help uh, secure the ballot box and secure people's rights to vote and see what the effects were of the pandemic ultimately on the election. I'd also like to go through and, and talk a little bit about what actual reforms took place. What did states do to help try to make sure that uh, turnout would remain high and that ballot access was not uh, something that would prevent people from, from voting? Um, one thing to keep in mind as we talk today is that a lot of the measures that were taken in 2020 were in fact temporary. Uh, they weren't permanent laws. And so that brings uh, uh, our attention to the idea that reform is, is just beginning. It's not over with. I also wanna dwell a little bit on the concept of uh, state and federal regulation in, in regards to elections. This is something that um, is being discussed, I think, more frequently. Usually this is more the purview of political scientists and maybe people who are a little more inside politics or government. Um, but making decisions about elections reform really brings to the fore uh, a, a, um, a truism in American politics about federalism, that elections are um, typically meant or understood to be a, a state level responsibility. But the federal government has uh, constitutional authority 
to regulate federal elections. And uh, you know, I would anticipate that we'll be hearing more about things that the federal government can do um, to help ensure the integrity of, of elections. And then last thing I wanna talk about is uh, there's the partisan battle over ballot reform that's happening right now. And I think America is being faced with, you know, basically two paths, moving forward or moving backward. Um, I don't think staying still really is an option anymore. I think 2020 has demonstrated the effectiveness of ballot reform at uh, increasing turnout. And I think it's also exposed how changing the rules of the game can um, affect maybe partisan outcomes. And so playing, you know, sort of partisans and parties are always very concerned about the rules of the game. And, and unfortunately, ballot reform has become even more of a battleground on this question. So let's talk about 2020's disrupted election. I, you know, I, I wanna highlight a, a sort of a couple of key things, um, starting with the, the primaries. Um, you know, it's not, it's not absolutely obvious that, you know, 2020 would turn out in terms of turnout, uh, quite as well as it did. If we go back all the way to uh, the March primaries, you know, uh, we, we have a very front-loaded presidential selection process. And uh, in 2020, there was a uh, Democratic primary. There wasn't a Republican primary. And that, that primary was, you know, these primaries, the national primary was very front-loaded, like a lot of uh, they are every year. Uh, increasingly, states are vying to be first, whether they're a caucus or a primary. They feel like they could have more influence in uh, choosing a president if they get earlier in the calendar. And so, you know, as a consequence, uh, there were a lot of primaries clustered around March. Well, it also happened to be the time that the COVID pandemic was forcing a closure uh, of, of many states across the board, whether it be schools or businesses, uh, you know, everything was, was being challenged. And uh, unfortunately, Ohio found itself right in the middle of this. And without going into uh, too much detail about this, I just wanna point out that, you know, this was a, a, a real disruption uh, that caught, had some real consequences early on when states really were not prepared to deal with elections emergencies. Uh, certainly Ohio's laws were unclear, uncertain, lines of authority weren't certain, who exactly was in charge, was a pandemic and elections emergency, what could be done in these circumstances. All of these questions arose all at once and Ohio was ill prepared to answer them. They really weren't uh, prepared for an elections emergency. So as a consequence, there was a lot of confusion and conflict and, and it introduced opportunities for uh, partisanship as well. And so there was a big back and forth between health authorities, the legislature and the governor to try to figure out, and, and of course I should say the judiciary to try to figure out who was in charge and what could be done. Well, eventually there was a compromise made and, and uh, Ohioans were allowed to turn in ballots uh, all the way until April 28th. But as you can see in the, the table here um, to the right, it had a pretty profound effect on turnout. If we wanna compare, um, the 2016 presidential primary uh, in Ohio, 38% turnout that year. And in 2020, only 20% turned out. So while we can't say that the pandemic and, and the confused response by Ohio was the only thing limiting turnout, it certainly didn't do turnout any favors. But if we move forward uh, from March to November, um, the, you know, there's, there's reason to celebrate and be very pleased from a uh, a turnout standpoint about how well the 2020 election actually turned out. We had a record high turnout in the 2020 general election. Uh, no matter the way in which you decide to, to count who's eligible to vote, there's um, really two main ways that we try to measure um, turnout um, in terms of thinking about the denominator. One is something called uh, voting age population, and that's literally the population that's over 18. And then Another more restrictive measure is, uh, you know, voting eligible voters, and that is to say, you know, excluding felons and and others who are uh, unable to vote. And you can see by all these measures, uh, we not only did we have an uptick from 2016 to 2020, uh, but we had a record turnout. Uh, turnout increased nationally by seven percent over 2016, which is, you know, remarkable when you think about all the challenges we had to face with the pandemic. Uh, and it's also worth noting that this, the same was true across the country. Uh, no state had turnout go down 
the lowest was in Oklahoma, two and a half percent, and highest in Hawaii, almost 15%. In, there was a, an almost 15% increase in turnout in Hawaii that year. And that's something to celebrate. It's um, a remarkable uh, outcome and achievement um, given what could have happened looking back uh, early in, in the pandemic. So, but why, why did this happen? Was, you know, there's lots of reasons we could try to think about in terms of thinking what caused a higher turnout. Obviously people were very interested in the election. It was a very impactful election. So voter interest was very high, but that's rarely enough to drive turnout quite as high um, as we saw it. I think another reason that we have to look at maybe a primary reason really has to do um, with uh, the way in which voting options changed dramatically in 2020. Uh, states, you know, had to scramble at first to figure out how is it that we're going to conduct our elections in a way to make in a way that makes sure that people feel safe uh, and encourages them to turn in a ballot. And you can see, looking uh, at this chart here, you know, comparing past elections going back to 1992, you know, go back to uh, Bill Clinton's first election in 1992, and you can see, um, let's call it 90% of voters voted on election day and maybe 5% voted by mail. And there was a general trend, you know, as we moved to 2016, where more and more uh, voters were voting by mail. You know, we sort of had uh, a slight uptick, you know, you can sort of see it move uh, towards 25% uh, in the middle, uh, in 2018 during the midterm elections. And you can also see that early voting became more common after 1992, you know, from zero, uh, to around, let's call it 20%. And then you can see from 2018 to 2020, states made some major changes. Uh, nearly half of the US voted by mail in 2020. Uh, and states made a variety of changes. Um, in several states, all voters received a mail-in ballot, including here in California for the first time. Other states, a handful of states, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, already had all mail-in balloting. But for a lot of other states, it was a quick adjustment to, to put these ballots out uh, through the mail to everyone. Uh, most voters at least received an absentee ballot application in several states, which, which again was not very common. Uh, some states loosened absentee ballot restrictions and others extended deadlines for mail-in ballots to be sent or received. And all of these uh, changes uh, changed the way people voted. Like, I, as you can see here, we had a lot more early and in-person voting, and we had a lot more voting by mail. And then, of course, a big dramatic decline in voting on election day. Uh, you know, not even a third of, of Americans uh, voted on election day in, uh, in 2020. So what does this have to do with turnout? Well, um, obviously, I think it has an effect, and it had an effect. All of these changes, while temporary and adjustments to the pandemic um, really did have a profound effect on turnout. I think this is the reason why we saw such high turnout, like despite the pandemic, people really had better options for voting. But at the same time, uh, unfortunately, like so many things we see in American politics now, this question became very polarized during the 2020 election. You might remember back to April in Wisconsin that there was an active partisan battle about mail-in balloting. For you regular newspaper readers, you might remember back to the Wisconsin uh, primary, there was also a state election at the same time that would decide the fate of one of the members of the Wisconsin Supreme Court, whether it was going to be a Republican or a Democrat. And Wisconsin Supreme Court had been a, um, a center of political battles in Wisconsin between Republicans and Democrats. And so, uh, you know, trying to get control access to ballots became um, a kind of partisan battle about who was going to be advantaged. Again, thinking about the rules of the game and the way parties play those rules of the game. It became a battle between a Democratic governor and a Republican legislator, le legislature about how they were going to reform balloting in Wisconsin. And about this time, you will remember that President Trump began to weigh in on the idea of mail-in balloting. I've got a little quote here from April of that year about the Wisconsin um, election. Uh, Trump says, uh, uh, mail-in ballots are very dangerous for this country. I'm doing my Trump. Maybe I'm triggering some of you because he's been out of office for a short time. Um, because of the cheaters. They go and collect them. They are fraudulent in many cases. Trump at this moment, and by extension, the Republican Party 
began to look at uh, mail-in balloting as being a, a, a change in the rules of the game that would dis disadvantage Republicans. And Trump, despite the fact that he himself voted absentee in Florida, began a campaign of attacking the idea, the legitimacy of mail-in voting for the remainder of the election. Uh, and GOP governors and legislators began to respond and they started to line up against the idea of loosening mail-in balloting requirements. Uh, despite this though, as you saw on the last page, several states, including Republican led states uh, did manage to uh, loosen restrictions. But as we got closer to election day, the, you know, amongst Republican voters, the very idea of casting a mail-in ballot became anathema. It was obviously an invitation for them to um, illegitimacy on the election and to cheating. Um, the idea was that, you know, there was no way to really secure mail-in balloting. And, and so people made a choice. GOP voters avoided mail-in balloting during the general election. You can see here, uh, in this uh, table uh, on the right, if you uh, look at, uh, at people who voted absentee in states versus people who voted on election day, there was a wide bias towards Democrats uh, voting absentee and a wide bias towards Republicans voting on election day. Um, you can see the gap most uh, widely in Pennsylvania, which of course was a battleground about everything related to elections and balloting this, this past election. Um, if you looked at people who voted by absentee, uh, they voted for, for Biden 76% to Trump 23%, a 54% spread uh, amongst those who voted by absentee. If you look at those who voted on election day, Trump was the winner, 65% to Biden's 34. It was an 85% gap in all. So the issue of it's not just a question of who you're voting for now, it's now a question of how you're going to vote. And that is now going to be a, a, another battlefield um, that America's facing when it comes to partisanship and polarization. Um, you know, as I said, you know, there, there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of gains made in terms of turnout in 2020. And part, you know, we could hopefully, you know, rest on our laurels and just sort of say, oh, all of these changes are done. American, uh, America had a, an experiment due to the pandemic. It was a success, success and, and now moving forward, we'll have more turnout in our elections. But it's important to remember that state ballot reforms were mostly temporary accommodations to the pandemic. They weren't permanent changes to elections laws. And so a lot of these things are res have reset or ended at the end of 2020. Um, just to give you an example, California just had to pass a law to extend um, mail, uh, mailing ballots out to all voters recently into 2021 because, uh, because we have elections coming up in March. Uh, there could be a recall election um, and, and uh, the, the measures that California took were temporary. So there's, a, there's now a movement and a recognition that you know, we need to lock in these gains as it were. Uh, there's a recent report that came out last month from the National Task Force on Election Crises. Uh, if you're interested, I encourage you just Google um, this organization. It's a collection of, of various um, uh, activists, experts uh, relating to elections laws. Um, they looked at what happened in 2020, uh, evaluated um, uh, the election and made some recommendations based on their findings. Um, and they made a number of, of state level suggestions about things that ought to be permanent. Um, and I'll just go through a few of those. One is I think obviously looking at the data uh, that states should sustain and expand early voting and mail-in voting options, that this has been a, a real boon for turnout. Uh, and that if we continue to give voters these options that hopefully we can sustain uh, higher levels of turnout than we have in the past. Another, is that there should be more investment in educating, communicating with voters about election mechanics. There was a lot of confusion, upset um, about how the, you know, the, the sort of sometimes bewildering variety of ways in which states and localities conduct elections, uh, including at the federal level, um, you know, how uh, electoral votes are counted, um, just basically, you know, basic understanding of America's uh, election system 
um, that we ought to do more to educate voters so there aren't so many surprises and that people's ignorance or confusion or uncertainty can be exploited. Um, and you know, another obvious uh, recommendation, ensure sufficient funding for election administration. Um, you know, elections can be an expensive business, uh, particularly when you start mailing ballots to everybody. When you think about the costs of, of infrastructure for the internet um, in order to ensure that people can vote online or not vote online, but rather register online, all of these things can become expensive in terms of resources. Um, so making sure that states are doing that. And then this is a one that we weren't all thinking of perhaps, but I think um, has, has had a light shown on it this last election and that's pre-canvassing of absentee ballots. If we expect more and more voters to vote early and by absentee, we ought to be making sure that state laws allow elections authorities to count them early. Uh, this is one of the reasons why in Florida, we see such quick returns on election night because essentially all California, or sorry, Florida counties have been counting the election ballots as they came in. There's other things that Florida's done to streamline uh, the count uh, to make sure that it runs more smoothly. California had to pass a law, a temporary law this past year to allow counties to do the same. And it did help speed up the count, uh, but more, more states need to do this so that uh, we don't have linger endlessly and lingering questions about who won after election night. And then in terms of legal reforms, making sure that the federal deadlines um, are incorporated into state laws. And I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, there are some, some deadlines that are both in federal statute and also in the US constitution um, that are part of electing a, uh, the president and are part of electing the Congress. And not all states uh, gear when they have to turn in their election results to make sure that they can do so in a timely manner that matches up with the federal timeline. This is something states need to think about. And then also reforming the state certification processes, which seem to be fairly easily exploited um, politically this, this past year, uh, despite the fact that on the whole, uh, whether there was Republicans or Democrats in charge, uh, I'm thinking in particular of places like Georgia where elections officials were uniformly uh, at the state level Republican, there was still a high level of integrity and uh, not so much game playing going on there. But there are ways I think and they think that we can do more to make sure the certification process uh, is, is more streamlined and um, certain and not exposed to partisan influence. Now, you'll note that I've said these are all state level reforms. Um, these are things that basically the states will have to consider themselves, not exactly federal reforms. And that is because you know there has been historically uh, um, uh, an understanding that states and localities in the United States are the ones that are in charge of the regulation of elections. But if you look at the constitution and if you look at case law, what you'll find is that the federal government, specifically Congress in their powers have very specific powers that have been upheld by the Supreme Court that allows them pretty wide authority to regulate federal elections. Most of this authority comes from Article I, Section 4. It's often called the Elections Clause. And it says that Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations uh, of the place, uh, time, manner, or place of elections for senators and representatives. So while states may have the power to regulate their own state elections, the federal government, specifically Congress, has the same right to do so for federal elections. And the Supreme Court has upheld that, um, you know, even if the, there is a departure between the ways in which states and the federal government choose to regulate those elections, that's okay. Because uh, Congress has this power in order to make sure that they can maintain the integrity of federal elections. Um, there's also a mention in Article Two, Section 1, that the Congress may determine the time of choosing of the electors and the day on which they shall give their votes. Uh, at, which has to be uniform throughout the United States. It's another uh, power they have over elections. And then in the 20th Amendment, um, it sets some pretty, pretty solid deadlines. It says that uh, the terms of the president and vice president end at noon on the 20th of January, and that the terms of senators and representatives end at noon on the third day of January. So these are pretty hard deadlines that states need to be aware of when I was talking earlier about making sure that 
uh, state election laws match up with this federal timeline. This timeline is set in stone in the constitution. And if things go beyond this, um, um, the government gets very uncertain. Um, so these are pretty hard deadlines. Despite Congress's power to regulate uh, federal elections, they've been fairly reluctant to do so. Um, one reason, of course, is about federalism. I think, uh, you know, for really since the founding of the Republic, Republicans and Democrats have had largely had a consensus on the idea that it's preferred to have states and localities conduct elections. There's been, there was, there's concern on a federalism level that if you nationalized elections that you create uh, the opportunity for a president or Congress to manipulate those elections potentially. If you have uh, you know, one national elections authority, which is something that other countries do, um, you know, we, we're, we're, we're fearful or have been fearful as a people about um, the, the national or federal influence that they could bring on, on elections. Um, that's changing, of course. Uh, you know, as I say these words, you may be disagreeing vehemently, but that just is the history. Uh, Congress has faced a number of different kinds of elections, um, um, challenges, emergencies, uh, disputes, uh, and they've been very reluctant following those to do much about them in law. I'll just, I just want to bring up one to talk, uh, to talk about because it has to do with the current um, administrative authority that the, the, the federal government has in terms of the regulation of elections. But it also shows you, you know, what a major crisis um, brought in terms of reform. So we can all remember back, I imagine, to the 2000 election and the recount controversy in Florida. Um, it was really uncertain who, who had won. Uh, it was really uncertain how Florida intended people to uh, count ballots. Uh, there was a protracted legal and political battle uh, trying to determine who was going to win that election. Um, and in, as a consequence, uh, Congress two years later, not immediately, but two years later in 2002 passed the Help America Vote Act, which set up a new administrative agency called the Elections Assistance Commission. And it's primarily focused on improving state voting machine standards because one of the lessons that Congress learned from 2000 was that, you know, Florida's elections machines and machinery and the way in which people voted was very outdated, very poorly designed. Uh, and one focus of improvement to make sure that 2000 didn't happen again was essentially investing in better machinery to vote. And, and that's kind of what HAVA was focused on. Uh, it does have um, rulemaking authority but frankly, HAVA doesn't have a lot of teeth in it. It provides grants to states. It essentially tries to encourage states to adopt more uniform measures about uh, machines. It does provide great uh, grants about um, other things that relate to the security of elections. It's not to say that HAVA doesn't do a lot of, a lot of good, um, but it doesn't have a lot of teeth. It really isn't uh, an administrative response. It's more trying to increase capacities and encourage states to adopt a more uniform approach to um, conducting elections. There's really more, a lot more that Congress could do if they chose um, to create more national standards uh, in regards to our elections. And as an indication of that, something you might have been reading about in the paper lately, something that's sort of in the conversation in Washington about uh, federal elections reform is, uh, is a bill called HR1, the For the People Act. Um, Typically in the House and the Senate, the first bills that are introduced during a legislative session are considered the priorities for the leadership in that chamber. And so in 2019, HR1, the very first bill, so this, this implies that it's a big, a big priority. Uh, HR1 was introduced um, by Democrats uh, to try to um, use Congress's authority, both in terms of resources, but also in terms of, of regulatory power to create a more uniform system of elections administration uh, with the hope that this would increase access and turnout uh, at, during elections. And this bill was first introduced, as I said, a couple of years ago. Uh, it passed very early in the session, March 8th, but it was a, and it was a party line vote. Uh, but almost immediately, uh, you know, it hit uh, partisan disagreement. Then uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell was very against the bill. 
He said it would go nowhere in the Senate and he actually refused to even allow a vote on it. And so HR1 kind of died uh, almost right away uh, in, com uh, in, a, in a committee in the Senate and never made its way to the floor of the Senate. But the bill has been reintroduced January of this year. Um, it's, it's still a priority of, of the leadership of the House of Representatives, the Democrats. <clears throat> and it's something that I think a lot of uh, Democrats are starting to point to as an example of what, we could, what the federal government could do to fundamentally reshape the way in which we conduct our elections. And I'll just go through a few, uh, few of the reforms that relate specifically to what I'm talking about today. That is those that have to do with ballot reform. Although there are a lot of other uh, changes that this act seeks to make such as on uh, campaign finance reform, for example, uh, also making the District of Columbia a state. So it would have senators, so statehood for DC. It's um, certainly an ambitious and um, controversial bill, I think for Republicans, um, but contained within it are these ballot reforms that I think we can see you know, the use for these uh, based on what we saw in 2020. So one is that Congress would require states to offer same day voter registration for federal elections. So that would be a reform that would be uniform throughout the United States rather by state by state. Uh, it would focus on uh, early voting by requiring states to hold early voting for at least 15 days. It would require states to offer online voter registration and it would expand opportunities to vote by mail and it would make election day a federal holiday. So there's lots of things. I mean, it's a 700 page bill, it's quite expansive, but there are things within it um, that would um, really for the first time uh, have Congress step in and do more, I would say the first time since the 19th century, step in to do more to make sure that um, federal elections were higher turnout. There's two ways this can go though. We've been talking about federal reforms at the state level. Um, as I was saying, this has become a very polarized topic and Republicans are coming together now um, to try to find ways not to um, um, sustain the, the, uh, the changes that were made in 2020 in terms of ballot access, but rather to take a step back. Uh, if you look at what states are doing right now, uh, and this is according to the Brennan Center for Justice, 33 states have introduced, pre-filed, or carried over 165 different restrictions on the ballot this year. And if you want to, you know, for comparison, you know, maybe it's always this way. Um, no, if you go back to February 3rd before the pandemic, only 35 bills in 15 states existed. Um, there's a lot of focus amongst Republicans in particular on trying to make the ballot not less restrictive, but more restrictive. And battleground states are, of course, uh, presidential battleground states are becoming battlegrounds for the changes in state laws. Uh, if you look at Arizona, they have the most bills under consideration right now. They have 19 different bills. Pennsylvania comes in second with 14. And then Georgia has 11. These are all critical states uh, during the 2020 election and will be again in 2024. <clears throat> Let's just look at some of the, the reforms that are being proposed. Uh, in Arizona, this is very narrow defeat of a bill. There was one Republican vote uh, that ended up killing it in, in the state Senate, but it would have essentially removed voters from their permanent early voting list who didn't vote early in four consecutive primary and general elections. So if every single election consecutively that you voted in, if you missed one of them, you would no longer be considered a permanent absentee in essence. Uh, Georgia has had a number of bills introduced. Uh, one would prohibit the use of ballot drop boxes. Another would require voters to include a photocopy of their photo ID with their absentee ballot applications and with their completed mail ballot. Uh, and then there's another bill to eliminate automatic voter registration, you know, motor voter laws. Um, there's different ways that states try to make it easier for people to be, to basically they'd have to opt out to not be uh, a registered voter. Uh, Georgia wants is, uh, there's a bill to consider uh, eliminating that. And in Pennsylvania, there are four different proposals in, uh, that have been introduced to, to eliminate no excuse mail voting. Um, this is probably something that you heard about um, in states like Texas uh, that had the option to have a mail-in absentee ballot, but they required that you had to have some excuse um, uh, 
you know, illness, you know, some something other than simply a preference to vote um, by absentee. Certain states actually require you to to have this excuse. Uh, Pennsylvania, uh, back in 2019, had eliminated their excuse, and now there's already four different bills to try to reintroduce reintroduce it. So, looking at this map here, these are all states that have a, a, what the Brennan Con Center considers a, a more restrictive ballot access um, proposal. Uh, so a lot going on across the country. I just wanted to say uh, last thing here that uh, uh, as was uh, indicated maybe at the beginning of the presentation, I'm a director of the policy lab at Claremont McKenna and you know, we're working right now on a project with the American Enterprise Institute on disrupted elections reform. Um, really thinking back to Ohio's example uh, and also thinking to all the reforms that occurred uh, in 2020, uh, states are really ill prepared to deal with elections emergencies, either through not having clear lines of authority to not being uh, able to declare an elections emergency without any kind of general emergency being declared. States are ill prepared. Some like Florida, California, Oklahoma, Virginia, they do have some relatively expansive elections emergency statutes. But by and large, America is not well prepared for an emergency. You know, a pandemic is, is unusual in a lot of different ways. One in particular is that it's kind of a slow rolling uh, emergency and it really did give states time and space to prepare for the general election. But not every elections emergency is going to be a pandemic. There's earthquakes, there's wars, there's cyber attacks, there's weather, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes. Um, there's many ways in which uh, elections can become disrupted. And we're working on a project to come up with some recommendations that Congress can consider to help create a more uniform state response to elections emergencies. So it's an issue that I'm working on and interested in and just wanted to mention that at the end. So I've now spoken for almost uh, 30 minutes or a little over uh, and I'll stop there and ask if we have any questions. So please, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A box. Um, we have one question. I don't know if you saw it yet, Zach, but uh, uh, the question is about how, um, if people have to turn in photocopies of their ID, how does that affect the secret ballot issue? Oh, hi, Cindy. Um, nice to see you virtually. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, not necessarily. Uh, I think what could happen is that you could seal your ballot in a security envelope and then also include um, a photocopy of your ID inside an envelope. But I think the takeaway from this you know, proposed Georgia reform is just trying to find ways, um, I mean, you know, to play both sides here. And it's sort of a trade-off that's seen between Republicans and Democrats. I think a Republican would say, well, this is about security. It's about uh, making sure that there hasn't been something done uh, where there's some kind of elections fraud and you're not the person that you say you are when you're asking for a ballot or when you're returning it. But of course, everything you do that requires some kind of further verification also has an effect on one's ability or likelihood of casting a ballot. You know, when you think about, you know, if you want to include a copy of your ID, well, then you need access to a copier or a printer of some kind. What if you don't have an ID? Um, all of these things would essentially um, make it more difficult to vote. Um, so, you know, I think that's probably gonna be the, the crux of the argument uh, about that um, in Georgia and across the country where similar bills are being introduced. Um, I don't see any more questions, but I have a comment that I did put in the chat earlier. Um, the League of Women Voters were among the groups that helped uh, craft HR1 and are very much in favor of passing HR1. So they, have been promoting it for quite a long time. And we occasionally get um, requests from them that we uh, send emails and phone calls and postcards to our own legislators to en encourage them uh, to vote for HR1. Um, so we are hoping that it at least gets a hearing in the, in the Senate this time, um, because it does look like it will improve elections by quite a bit. Yeah, you know, politically circumstances have changed quite a bit um, to actually make HR1, I think, much more likely to at least get a hearing in the Senate because of course uh, the, the, the partisan shift and the willingness of uh, 
Chuck Schumer to hear this out. And the fact that we just experienced 2020, I think it's moved this issue up the agenda where most Americans now sort of see how these reforms, how meaningful these reforms could be. Um, our next question is, is, how do you feel about the California Voter Rights Act uh, with districts for local elections? Do you think it will lead to more diverse elected leaders? It's an interesting question. Um, for those of you who are familiar, I mean, those of you who live in Claremont, you've had to experience uh, a recent uh, division of the city into districts um, and had to deal with the fact that, that Cal uh, California right now, um, there's, you know, there's a federal voting rights act. Uh, and, and of course the, the purpose of the federal voting rights act had to do with um, trying to correct previous ills um, having to do with discrimination at the ballot box and making sure that um, states could not change the machinery of elections to, to disadvantage minorities from having a full and fair opportunity to run for office uh, and to vote. California uh, took a step beyond um, the, the federal law and is, is, is more restrictive in certain ways uh, on cities in this case where um, virtually any at-large election. If you have a city uh, and you basically choose your um, elected officials throughout the city, so everyone represents the entire city, essentially as things stand, California, um, the, the California Supreme Court considers that to, to violate the uh, Voting Rights Act. Um, and so it's become a little bit of a cottage industry where uh, attorneys will sue cities at, uh, under the California Voting Rights Act if they have at-large elections. And cities almost entirely lose, have lost if they've tried to challenge this principle. Uh, there's been one exception. Uh, the city of Santa Monica has challenged this and they've actually won at the district court level. And so there may be some changes that will be happening in the future in California state law regarding the, this question of at-large elections being presumed to be discriminatory. But I can say here in um, Claremont, for instance, uh, that you know one, one result of districting has been to create one of the five districts in Claremont to, be, to represent uh, minority interests more. Um, you know, Claremont's largest uh, minority population is concentrated in the south of Claremont, and it happens to be Hispanic. And we uh, saw a, uh, um, a person of Hispanic heritage who speaks Spanish uh, in that fifth district get elected to the council. So uh, it seems, you know, this person may have been uh, elected regardless, but I do think that may have been an effect of districted elections. Um, if a person registers to vote online, what is the mechanism to verify signatures when a ballot is returned? Uh, it well, it depends. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a good question because it's something that states are required, have relaxed in 2020, this, this signature verification requirement for people who wholly had uh, registered online. But I, you know, I, I'll punt this question a little bit without getting into the, the details to say that I think one of the false assumptions underlying this question of elections integrity is the idea that mail-in balloting or online registration is somehow a breeding ground for corruption and fraud, and it is not. Uh, there is fraud and uh, you know, either through um, you know, uh, voting when you're not supposed to, voting more than once, casting a ballot for somebody else, these things are vanishingly rare. Uh, and do not in any way affect the outcomes of elections. And so I think, you know, as we, it's, it's legitimate, I think, it, because we won't always want our elections to seem as open, fair, and legitimate as possible, because if people don't feel that elections are legitimate, they will not believe the outcomes are legitimate. Um, but at the same time, I think we have to be cautious about solving a problem that doesn't exist uh, when we think about, um, the limits to the necessity for uh, safeguards um, on the ways in which we register and vote. Um, and this is the last question here so far. Can federal legislation prevent the voting, the vote suppression efforts which you discussed with regards to Arizona, uh, Pennsylvania and Georgia? Yes, potentially. Um, 
HR one, you know, doesn't necessarily touch on everything that I was talking about um, in terms of, of what those states are attempting, but it will do certain things like ensuring that you, there will be same day registration across the country, that early voting will be an option for everybody, uh, and that mail-in balloting will be an option for everybody. So it, essentially it will um, reduce the opportunity for states to um, narrow the options for ballot access. It will make sure that at least in terms of federal elections, that uh, states will have to follow a more uniform standard um, that is uh, biased towards mail-in balloting, early balloting, and same-day registration. So it'll help. So the next two questions actually seem like lectures in their own right, uh, but I'll ask the question. Um, can you trace the history of voting restrictions in a southern state like Georgia from the Jim Crow era to today? Uh, yeah, I think you can. Um, just a top of mind, um, you know, we look at these runoff elections like we had in Georgia, where if no vote getter gets below or gets above 50% in the general election, that there's there has to be a runoff election. And this is this dates back to, um, you know, Georgia's segregationist past, where uh, Georgia was essentially a one party government, uh, and that was the Democratic Party and Republicans were never uh, really uh, competitive um, from post reconstruction really until um, the 1980s and into the 1990s. And so this is a, a hangover that that was essentially a, a way for states who had essentially one party government to, um, you know, have some kind of, of mechanism uh, for choosing uh, during the general election so that every election didn't end with the primary because whoever got elected to uh, in, an, in a primary, it was going to be a Democrat. Um, and this gave uh, voters an opportunity um, to maybe choose between two Democrats if no one got above 50%. So, you know, it's a holdover from, um, from Georgia's reconstructionist past, or not reconstructionist, segregationist past. Um, and and there, are, there are many things like that that are spread around throughout the South. This, you know, the federal government and the Voting Rights Act has not found these kinds of elections to be prima facie or, or um, you know, in law to be discriminatory in any way. Uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, we can't trace a lot of, of the push and the pull of, um, segregation being reflected in the ways in which uh, southern states have organized their elections. Something I didn't talk about because I didn't have time, but redistricting is another big portion of this, and that's something else that HR1 attempts to, uh, to deal with. Um, we have two more quick questions. Well, one that, um, what can be done about voter misinformation that causes doubt in election outcomes? Yeah, that's a really good question, and it's a difficult one. It's probably the most ticklish one of all, uh, because, uh, and this is something, by the way, this um, task force on elections crises, they had a number of different recommendations related to what could be done with media and social media to deal with misinformation, disinformation uh, being spread, uh, you know, not only before, but obviously after November, the November election. And here's the problem. Um, it's the constitution again. We have real constraints on government power when it comes to first amendment rights to free speech. There's not a lot that the government can do, even if you speak a falsehood uh, to punish you or to suppress your speech. Um, we have probably, I would say the most uh, broad and protective free speech rights of any country in the, in, in the world. Um, and the Supreme court is very, um, restrictive on what the government can consider in any way to be um, suppressible speech. Uh, we heard a conversation about this, <laughs> you know, like, you know, emergencies always bring out, you know, um, uh, details about American government, you know, Brandenburg versus Ohio, this idea of uh, incitement as being uh, not protected speech. This was a discussion that was going on around whether Trump's speech on January 6th could be considered incitement and therefore uh, you know, punishable speech. That's about the one area in which the, the Supreme Court has basically said that yes, you can uh, pass laws to, to suppress that kind of speech. But beyond that, 
very, very broad uh, protections for free speech. Um, I, you know, so a lot of this would have to be voluntary in some way. Um, there's ways perhaps, um, you know, this is probably, this is a longer discussion than we have time for, but there's been a lot of discussion about the fairness doctrine, for example, as being a possible way forward. I don't think it is. I think the fairness doctrine is a pretty outmoded uh, principle or law uh, because broadcasting has just changed so much. Uh, the fairness doctrine was, was essentially effective in trying to police broadcasting back when virtually every broadcaster had to rely on a federal license in order to use uh, the airwaves. Now, um, you know, if you have a, a cable company, uh, if you have an internet provider, um, it's really difficult for government to do much of anything. I think probably the one area that has some potential is ownership rules, um, making sure that no one company or person has a disproportionate share of ownership of media. Um, those laws are still on the books. Um, there are limits. They, there are still there's still a push for deregulation in this area. There's actually even a case recently uh, before the Supreme Court within the last month relating to ownership. Uh, and media. So in order to encourage maybe a diversity of voices, maybe that's a possibility through ownership rules. Uh, but in terms of direct regulation, there's very limited options that uh, government can take directly to change that circumstance. Um, we have a, a question that came up in the chat. Um, if you have an opinion about the likelihood of HR1 getting passed, I think it will pass through the, the House of Representatives uh, as it did in 2019. Um, it's a much tougher question in the Senate. I think what's likely to happen, I mean, HR1 is frankly ambitious. It includes, uh, it's kind of an omnibus reform bill that includes you know, campaign finance reform, DC statehood, uh, redistricting reform, ballot access reform, all into one omnibus bill. And so I think probably what's more likely to happen is that it gets broken up in the Senate uh, that you, we might get more distinctive bills, that HR1 gets broken up into to, um, separate priorities um, and that they're considered on, on a one-by-one -one basis. Because I think my reading is that if HR1 was considered as an omnibus in the Senate, I don't think it would be likely to pass. I think there might have to be more done to compromise um, to make sure that, you know, Joe Manchin and others are, are happy with, uh, with the result. Um, what do you think is the effect uh, or potential of primaries in which the top two uh, candidates run regardless of party as in California? Well, I can, it's a good question. Um, it's a long answer potentially. Um, it's an, <sighs> Trying to think how to approach this uh, in the last you know five minutes or so. I'll say this: um, the idea of, of what is essentially a nonpartisan primary—that is to say that every candidate will run together on the same ballot, regardless of party, and that the top two vote getters will go on to a general election. The, you know, this this was the result of some Supreme Court cases that protected parties' associational rights, essentially their right to choose their own party members, and a preference on the behalf of, of voters to have as many choices as possible on the primary ballot, uh, and to try to remove the influence of parties as much as possible. And, you know, California, Washington, and a few other states now have, you know, essentially nonpartisan elections, you know, uh, the Cajun primary, which is similar in Louisiana, they've had it for a number of different years. I think the question moving forward, there's more research that needs to be done um, to really come to a consensus about this, but I will say this, the idea that somehow nonpartisan elections opened up elections somehow to more moderate candidates and moderate voters has not been the case. It certainly hasn't been in California. And that's how this, this law was sold to California voters was that, oh, we won't get such partisan results. We'll, we'll actually get more moderate results uh, from this uh, top two primary. And that just hasn't been the case. So, you know, on its own arguments or merits, it doesn't seem to have, have passed. I think there's also some question now too of, um, 
you know, what is it that we can do to ensure some level of uh, stability and selection on behalf of parties that make sure that we don't get the most extreme choices every um, primary season? Because the primary electorate is always smaller, it's always more partisan, uh, and it's always more responsive to the most partisan voices uh, and issues in an election. And I think it's one of the reasons why Trump cleaned up in 2016 in a, a pretty broad Republican field. Uh, it, it really opens itself up to a more populist influence where, um, you know, if, if, if the most, if the angriest, loudest, most involved and most partisan voices are the ones that are showing up, that's gonna be reflected in who gets chosen to be uh, president. Um, but, you know, I won't, I won't speak to, uh, too forthrightly about that yet, but I don't think um, nonpartisan elections have been the panacea for moderation that uh, that they were sold as. Um, I don't I don't know how much more time we want to take, but there's one here about what are the prospects for more states to do California style redistricting, which is an issue that the League of Women Voters has been working hard on as well. Well, I, there are more states that are signing on. Um, I'm blanking on the, the most recent state. I think it's Iowa. Don't quote me on that. Um, but this this is uh, um, an idea I think that's more in its ascendancy right now, the idea of a nonpartisan um, redistricting commission. You know, certain states have had this for years, like Washington State has had it since the 1980s, California more recently. Um, but I do think, um, you know, the focus politically in state legislatures in terms of getting Republicans or Democrats elected the ways in which resources are spent, a surprising amount of resources are spent simply to try to game redistricting. Um, and so, you know, there's, I think there's, there's some benefits uh, and some trade-offs to, to redistricting commissions, but I think on the whole, it does help to reorient a legislature's focus on winning elections and, and a more fair way in which um, districts are, are created that are more respective of communities of interest, um, majority minority districts, and, and just trying to make every election about, um, um, you know, the rules of the game. Um, and that's, you know, that might be a good place to end because uh, we're coming up on three o'clock is just sort of returning back to this idea of the rules of the game because you know, it, it, we seem to have a system in American politics right now, it's kind of winner takes none, where the election never ends and where people are more concerned about the rules of the game than they are about policymaking. And reforms that we can take to try to refocus energies, uh, political energies off of um, permanently contesting elections, um, off of the most partisan choices, uh, that at the ballot box. Um, and in terms of state legislatures, politicians and others being incentivized to create policy rather than to create division, I think those are all to the positive and something that you know we need more of uh, in, in the US. So I wanted to, to stop and, and think about, you know, uh, it's not a sermon, what, are the, what do they say? Uh, just a thought, not a sermon. Uh, that's how I'd like to end for today. Thank you. Um, before we close, um, I want to uh, remind everybody that uh, our next talk uh, will be on March 21st at two o'clock, and it will be by uh, a reporter, Mark Rod, who some of you may know, um, who uh, was in the inside the Capitol during the insurrection. Um, he was a reporter, and he is going to talk to us about uh, what it was like to be inside the Capitol at that time. I also want to let you all know that we are in the midst of our nominating process for officers for next year. So if anybody is looking to be on our board, uh, please let us know. Um, I'm sure we can find a place for you. So uh, thank you, Zach, for being here. We, you've done a great job and we, we appreciate uh, your help in all of this. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time and attention and thanks for the invitation. You're welcome.